So I will, in this lecture, say something about banking. But before I get to banking, I still want to add a few, um, uh, few remarks, some uh, loose ends um, concerning money. Um, first, first, a remark about um, the proposal that has been made by many people that instead of having something like a gold standard or a silver standard, um, we should have um, uh, what they call a commodity reserve money. That is um, a money that is not backed by gold or silver, but by a bundle of goods um, that is backed by uh, a ton of oil, uh, three, three pounds of butter, uh, five bikes, and things like, uh, uh, things like this. Um, it is easy to see what is awkward about this proposal. I should mention, for instance, the various Chicago economists, uh, older Chicago economists have uh, proposed something like this. Um, what's wrong with this can be uh, immediately recognized by asking the question, can titles to bundles of goods um, be money? And the answer is no, because bundles of goods are by definition uh, less saleable than the most saleable of, the comp of, of a component of this bundle. And again, recall, the purpose of money is, so to speak, to be the most easily saleable of all commodities. Now, a bundle of commodities is always more difficult to sale than the most saleable element of a bundle. For this reason, so-called proposals for commodity reserve money uh, should be discounted as somehow uh, counterintuitive, uh, counterproductive to the very purpose of, uh, of money. A second remark um, concerns a proposal that has been made by Hayek in a book that's called The Denationalization of Money, where he proposes, okay, government gets out of the business of money producing, which is, of course, also the view of the mainstream within the Austrian, uh, Austrian school. But Hayek's idea is uh, there should be multiple issuers of paper monies. Um, and they should compete against each other um, by building up a reputation for stabilizing their currency in a sufficient way. So the idea is something like there should be Hoppe money, Hülsmann money, Mises money, Rosbart money, and so forth, each of which supposedly is a paper money. Now, this, this is, so to speak, a crackpot idea. Um, what is crackpot about it is uh, that uh, when you try to introduce these paper monies, then at that moment nobody has any idea of what the purchasing power of a, of a 10, 10 unit Hoppe money is, or a 10 unit Hülsmann money is, or a 10 unit Rosbart money is. So they cannot be initially accepted at all. What, Mies, what Hayek here misunderstands or has not really recognized fully is Mises' insight that uh, any type of money must initially be a commodity money traded in barter because only then do people have an idea of what the initial purchasing power of this commodity is and then additional purchasing power is added to it as soon as this commodity is also demanded for the very first time 
uh, as a medium of, of exchange. That is, in order to start a money, people must have an idea of what it is that you get for it. Um, and in order to get this idea, it is necessary that that thing was first also used in barter and could buy something in barter. This way you can form an idea of what you get for an egg, what you get for an apple and so forth. Pure paper monies can never get off the ground. So this Hayek proposal should be discarded as being a crackpot idea. Um, the, third, the third remark concerns the idea that some people like Milton Friedman have proposed about uh, national paper currencies um, with the claim that there exist, so to speak, optimal currency areas that there should not be necessarily a worldwide used money. Um, now this idea also seems to, seems to me to be entirely mistaken. Um, and that can also be easily recognized by recognizing that uh, national borders are of course artificial. They have in a way no economic meaning. If you go back in history you find that borders have been drawn in a completely different, different way. Sometimes countries have been enlarged, sometimes countries have been split up uh, into uh, a larger number of units. Just imagine for a second we would have a massive secessionist movement going on and would all of a sudden have uh, 3,000 different countries. Um, each of these countries having their own paper currency. Um, now, would this be an advantage? And the answer is, no, this would be almost throwing us back into a system of barter. Uh, trading now between these 3,000 different entities would be enormously complicated. Um, it is a huge advantage if we just don't have a large number of different currencies, but one or two covering the entire world. And the idea of an optimal currency area, uh, sh short of the world, is just as idiotic as the idea of an optimal trading area. Um, the optimal trading area is also the entire world. Um, we cannot say it is optimal that only Germans trade among Germans and not with Danes. Um, and Danes not with people living in Iceland. No, the optimal solution is indeed that the entire globe partic participates in the division of labor and the optimal currency area is also the entire world, one and the same currency being used all over the world. The last remark, again directed against Friedman, um, is um, concerns the idea that opponents of commodity money standards such as the gold standard or the silver standard, opponents such as Friedman in particular, have always argued uh, against commodity monies and in favor of a paper money by pointing out this. Uh, don't we, when we use a gold standard or a silver standard, use many useful resources in order to dig out gold out of the ground, silver out of the ground, and couldn't we use all of these resources that are currently devoted to the production of these metals, couldn't we devote these resources, whatever, to produce bread or milk or beer or something that would give uh, immediate satisfaction to people. So he calls this a waste of resources uh, that uh, comes about by uh, favoring a commodity money standard. Um, now I want to show that there are several arguments, uh, uh, several points wrong in this, in this argument. Uh, the most important one is this. If we have a national paper money instead of a commodity money, then this national paper money 
must be produced by a monopolist. That is, we cannot have uh, competition in the area of producing dollar bills. If there would be competition in the area of producing dollar bills, um, then we would immediately have uh, hyperinflation. Um, so we must restrict the production of dollar bills to one monopoly institution, and all others must be outlawed from it. But we know, of course, from uh, monopoly theory that whenever a monopolist produces uh, a product, uh, he tends to produce it at higher cost and at lower quality than would be brought about under competitive um, conditions. If you are the only producer that can produce money, then you can raise your cost almost to the sky. Look, it costs almost nothing to print a note. Um, and that would, cause, of course, become manifest as soon as everybody would be able to go into this business. Uh, that's why the purchasing power of this type of money would basically fall to, fall to zero because it costs zero to produce it. Um, but uh, if you are a monopolist, you can just basically just uh, pay yourself as a producer of this money astronomical salaries. Um, that is, you can produce something that can be produced at almost zero cost, also at exorbitant costs, because nobody can go into competition against you. Um, the operation of the Federal Reserve System in the United States is enormously costly. Um, as I said, they employ tens of thousands of economists at, at huge salaries. They all drive uh, business class whenever they fly some, uh, someplace. These are also all costs. Uh, I think the cost might be well higher than all the costs that were ever used in order to dig uh, um, gold out of the ground. In addition, uh, you create, um, by, pre by producing uh, paper money, far more uncertainty about what will be the future quantity of money. As long as gold is money, people have some rough idea what sort of gold findings there are, what, uh, uh, how much you can find here and there, and you have a certain amount of predictive capability of what the future will bring. When it comes to predicting what the future quantity of paper money will be, not even, not even Alan Greenspan knows that right now. Tomorrow something might happen and they say, oh, we need such and such an increase in it and so forth. So enormous increase in, the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uncertainty, financial uncertainty is brought about. And this leads to large numbers of institutions, financial advisors, uh, various types of hedge funds and so forth, that come into existence that otherwise would not have come into existence at all. And these funds and these investment advisors also use up uh, quite a bit of uh, resources. And because of the financial uncertainty, gold becomes an inflation hedge. And if we look, for instance, at the gold prices, then we find that uh, while we were under the gold standard, the price of gold was $35 per ounce of gold at the point when the United States went off the gold standard. In the meantime, you know that the price of, the price of gold uh, is in the neighborhood of $450, uh, $450 per ounce of gold, uh, indicating that there is likely more gold being mined now than there was at the time when it was $35. $35. Um, it is interesting that the older Friedman, in an article in 1988, realized all this. So he went back and said, you know, my main argument before, before paper money standard was this resource savings argument. And then he just admits all of these things that I mentioned here, um, and that I, I was wrong in all of this. Um, 
No, Friedman's methodology is, um, no, yeah, you die with your predictions. So he made the prediction it will use, it lower the resource costs. Now he admits it actually raised the resource costs to have a paper money. Um, but was Milton Friedman willing to just say, I was wrong and the gold standard was better than what we currently have? No way. Um, so they don't even follow their own methodological prescriptions when it doesn't fit into their uh, preconceived scheme. He admits that he was all wrong, but says, yeah, but nonetheless, we have to stick with the paper money. Um, so now I want to come to, uh, to banking. And there exist basically uh, two, two types of banks, traditionally two types of banks that were institutionally actually separated in modern times have become uh, integrated into one institution. Uh, the first one is uh, what we call savings and loan institutions. Um, savings and loan institutions uh, are characterized by the fact that we have a saver who hands over property of his for some time, specified time, over to the bank. Um, and the bank uh, hands over the property that they received from, uh, from the saver to uh, some borrower. Um, and the bank makes its money from the interest differential. That is the interest that they pay the savers on the one hand and the interest that they charge uh, the borrowers on the other hand. And competition between the savings and loan institutions would see to it that this differential between um, uh, interest paid to savers and interest charged to borrowers will tend to be um, a, a minimum, uh, a minimum uh, difference. Um, Notice also that all credit that is um, given to borrowers by these types of institutions is what we can call commodity credit. Um, in the following sense, uh, the savers, by giving up ownership for certain periods of time in money handed over to the bank have indeed abstained from using some available real resources. And these available real resources that they have abstained from using are now handed over, so to speak, to the borrowers. Um, they can, so to speak, engage now in investment projects and pay their workers, so to speak, with those goods that the savers abstained from using. This is an important uh, point that will come out when, uh, when we later on will talk about the business, the business cycle theory, because in the business cycle theory, uh, large parts or parts of the loans being extended to investors are not commodity credit, but are instead fiduciary credit or circulation credit, as Mises points it out. That is, credit that are simply created out of thin air um, by printing up additional banknotes that are offered uh, for loan purposes, but without anybody having actually abstained from consuming uh, any goods without commodities backing these credits. Um, so genuine loan and savings banks only hand over to the borrowers uh, goods that other people have indeed abstained using and make these goods free for investment purposes um, by, um, by the borrowers. Um, 
savings and loan banking has no influence on the money supply. It does not increase the money supply at all. Money is just transferred from one hand to the other and returned. No increase in the money supply results from the institution um, of savings and loan banks. Savings and loan banks also do not have to hold any reserves um, because no one in a savings and loan bank has the right to come at any time and have their deposits redeemed. Um, they enter a time contract uh, and the bank has only the obligation to pay up once these time contracts uh, uh, are expired. So a savings and loan bank can do with zero reserves only at the time when their uh, obligations fall due then they must have of course the money in order to repay to their, uh, to their savers. The second type of um, banking is uh, deposit banking. Um, as I said, institutionally, that developed actually separately um, out of um, goldsmiths who provided safekeeping services for people who wanted to put their gold at safer places than their, their own kitchen table. Um, and since they had vaults, they were the preferred people to go and deposit your money um, for safekeeping purposes. In deposit banking, uh, there is no transfer of property that takes place. Um, the depositor does not give up his property. Uh, he only hands it over to the bank for safekeeping purposes. Um, this is called um, a bailment contract. There's not a loan extended to the bank. Um, the, the bank cannot count that among as its assets, the gold that was deposited there. In the same way as if you deposit your furniture, let's say you move from one place to another, you deposit your furniture in a furniture warehouse and then you get tickets. Um, then the furniture warehouse would also not, in its book, uh, list your furniture as assets of the furniture warehouse. Um, they remain in your possession. Um, you pay a default deposit fee for this service um, that they do, um, and the income of the bank is this deposit fee. Um, there is again, because of competition in this institution of deposit banks, a tendency that these fees tend to be minimum, uh, minimum fees. People go to banks that charge lower fees, other things being the same, and avoid to um, go to banks that charge um, lower, lower fees. Um, these warehouses, these deposit banks, uh, give you a ticket. Uh, the ticket can be redeemed at any time you want, at any time when the bank is open, during opening, opening times, of course. Um, and the, the circulation of these tickets is in some way limited. Uh, Yes, people can accept these tickets as payments, um, but it, one has to be aware of the fact that the tickets will be redeemed at par only uh, to the extent that the fee has in fact been paid. Um, that is, if you receive a ticket um, and then after five years you present your ticket and want your gold um, out of the bank, um, but uh, deposit fees were only paid for two or three months, then of course you will not get your tickets redeemed at par, 
but there will be uh, extra fees for safekeeping uh, charged, which means that by and large there will be a constant tendency for people to quickly redeem their tickets uh, into gold in order to avoid this, uh, um, uh, these late, late, pay late payments uh, of, um, uh, of, of fees that otherwise uh, would result. Again, um, deposit banks also have no influence on the money supply as long as they hold 100% reserves. That is, for every ticket there is the equivalent amount of gold um, in, in the bank. Then the only thing that takes place is, so to speak, a change in the composition of money. Whenever you deposit gold, an equivalent uh, sum of money certificates or money substitutes will enter circulation. Um, and whenever you um, get your gold out, then the equivalent amount of money substitutes will, will be drawn out of circulation. So the composition of money, the form of money changes. There can be more genuine money and less substitutes in circulation or vice versa. But deposit banking in and of itself has also no influence on the money supply. Then we come to fractional reserve banking. And fractional reserve banking is in some ways, so to speak, uh, a confusion between savings and um, and deposit, uh, deposit banks. Um, the institution of fractional reserve banking arose simply out of the observation that deposit bankers made that not all ticket holders would come at the same time and wanted to have their tickets redeemed that there was always a certain amount of gold that remained in the banks. And based on this observation, they then came up with the idea, you know, why not print additional tickets that are backed by nothing and loan them out against interest um, and hope that these things have been repaid before all people will appear. Um, it should be clear that uh, what the consequences of this type of uh, practice are. Uh, first, from, uh, from a legal, legal point of view, um, by printing additional tickets, you have now uh, more than one owner of the same quantity of gold stored in the bank. You have, so to speak, two title holders, even though you have no more gold in the bank than you had before. So this would be a legal conflict that would manifest itself that if both of these individuals came to the bank at the same time, both could not be satisfied, obviously. Um, it also has an economic effect. Uh, the economic effect is again something that uh, uh, Guido Hülsmann will talk about more when he talks about uh, the business cycle uh, theory. Um, because uh, some of the money is now that is loaned out is of course invested in some uh, producer, producer goods um, which cannot be instantly liquidated and yeah, brought back into the form of money. Um, and, um, and this is, so to speak, a characteristic of, um, of the business, of a business cycle uh, um, situation. Um, that there's a mis mismatch in, um, in timing. Some people think it is immediately available, and in fact, it is bound up in time-consuming processes which cannot be stopped instantly and uh, the invested goods be 
reverted back into the original form of, uh, of money. Um, in addition, of course, uh, any type of fractional reserve banking um, will increase the money supply. Um, there are additional titles created without a corresponding amount of gold or silver or whatever the money commodity is being drawn out of circulation and in being in additional sums of money being created it has redistributive effects of the kind that I explained before. Those people who get the money first gain at the expense of people um, who get the money um, who get the money last. Um, uh, fractional reserve banking uh, has been in all countries by the courts recognized as legal. Um, despite the fact that in all other walks of life if you would do something like fractional reserve practices it is treated as fraud. Um, so if I would do what a fractional reserve bank does, for instance, with, in a furniture warehouse um, that is rely on the fact that not all people who have deposited their furniture at my warehouse come at the same time and, uh, and loan out Mr. Berking's chairs uh, for some for some ongoing party in the hope that the party will be over and the chairs will be returned to my warehouse before he arrives there and wants to get his chairs back, that would be considered fraud. Uh, in the case of banking, it is not considered to be uh, a fraudulent activity. Um, in the case of furniture warehouses to engage in this type of activity is also a little bit more difficult, I should mention, um, because furnitures are not what is called fungible goods, whereas money is fungible. That is, if you come and want your money back and your money is not there, they, they can give you the money of somebody else. Uh, and you don't care as long as you get the same sum of money. Um, if Mr. Berking comes and wants his chairs back and, uh, and the guy says, you know, you, un unfortunately your chairs are not here, but it, uh, I have Mr. M Mr. Miller's chairs, uh, why don't you take those? Uh, then the problem is, of course, that he might just have a personal attachment to his chairs because his grandmother left a sp specific smell on her chairs and, and Mr. Miller has a completely different smell and uh, these smells are incompatible, Th then the fraud becomes of course uh, uh, more apparent than if it is just money because as you know money doesn't stink. Um, so now we come to free banking. Um, free banking is a system of um, freely competing commercial banks, each of which is permitted to engage in fractional reserve banking. There has been some debate over whether it is appropriate to call such a system uh, free banking. Some debate about the word free. Uh, because you know when we refer to the free market uh, we also do not think that everything is permitted on the free market. The free market is not a system where everybody can do whatever he wants. The free market does not allow that I hit you on the head, that I steal your wallet and uh, rape and pillage and things like that. The free market is characterized by the fact that people uh, within their rights, with their property, engage in free exchanges. Free banking, however, as I indicated before, it is very doubtful whether that is really part of the free market because there seems to be some sort of fraudulent element involved in the whole thing 
from the outset because after all there are two title two people who have at the same time title to the same object let me go a, a moment astray and just illustrate this by another example let's say let's say you go to a car lot and you buy yourself a car but you don't take possession of the car you just because your garage has not been completed. You just leave it on the car lot. But, but you do get the title. Um, and then somebody else comes to the car lot and he sees your car standing around there. Um, and uh, the car dealer then sells your car a second time. Because after all, your car is still there. Uh, and all he has to do is print another title. So now there are two title holders. You have a title to the car, and the other guy has also a title to the car, but there is actually only one car there. Uh, is that fraud? In all other walks of life, this is, of course, fraud. Um, in any case, what, uh, what is the advantage and disadvantage of uh, a system of free banking? The advantage as compared to a monopolistic uh, system of monopolistic banking is simply this. Under a system of free banking, the fraud will be comparatively limited. Um, for one reason that I already explained, namely that as soon as one bank realizes that another bank has issued too many fake receipts, they can point that out to their clients and there will be a bank run ensuing. So it is dangerous for a bank to engage in such an activity because your competitors might take advantage of this weakness of yours. Um, secondly, uh, there exists what is called adverse clearing under uh, free banking. So if one bank issues fake notes, notes covered by nothing, then as long as these fake notes would only circulate among its own clients, nothing, nothing more dramatic happens than that, of course, a bank run can occur. Uh, but no bank can, of course, be sure that its own fake notes its own money substitutes that are covered by nothing will only circulate among its own clients. They will eventually end up in the hands of a client of a different bank. And this client will then approach his bank and uh, deposit these uh, fake tickets. And what will the bank where these fake tickets have been deposited do? They will, of course, immediately go to the bank that issued these tickets and ask for the real thing. That is, hand me over the gold or the silver or whatever it is. And as soon as that is the case, then uh, the, relatively, the relative solvency of the bank that issued these fake notes dwindles. Um, it has all of a sudden far less reserves than it previously had and becomes in a more and more precarious situation. For this reason, uh, free banks will tend to hold relatively high reserves, not 100%, uh, but also not as some people claim, I think White and Selgin, um, reserves that go approach zero. I think Mises is right that they uh, will tend to hold high reserves. Uh, nonetheless, from the point of view of bankers, of course, uh, this, is not, this is not a sufficient solution. Uh, uh, bankers like to inflate. After all, by printing fake notes, they can earn interest on it. So that they have to hold high reserves is something undesirable. They would rather have, hold no reserves at all. Um, so what can they do in order to reach this goal? And in order to reach this goal, 
um, they have to establish a central bank. And contrary to some myths, um, the establishment of central banks has in almost all cases been ardently supported um, by all major banking houses. Uh, it was the major banking houses of the Morgans and the Rockefellers and so forth in the United States that were behind the founding um, of the American Central Bank in, 19, um, in 1913. And what is created with, with a central bank is basically a system where you can engage in, uh, in coordinated inflation. So here you have the central bank and then you have the commercial banks who use the central bank just as we use commercial banks. That is, this, all commercial banks have accounts uh, in, in the central bank just as uh, you and me have accounts um, in the various uh, commercial banks. So indirectly, we are now all clients of the central bank, one step, one step removed. You recall, before the problem uh, in the way of inflating at will for a system of free banking was uh, that we were not all clients of the same, of the same bank. Now we do become clients of the same bank and it becomes easier to inflate starting with the central bank and then coordinate, coordinate inflation um, being uh, instituted by, um, by the various um, uh, commercial banks. And how does this, um, uh, how does this system now uh, operate? Um, I should this us under they all operate of course under fractional reserves so as long as we had the gold standard so at the bottom of the pyramid you had gold uh, then you had a larger amount of f federal reserve notes so your dollar notes for instance the the notes that are issued by the central bank the pyramid indicates of course that all these notes cannot be redeemed in gold because there are far more notes than gold. And then on top of that, uh, you have uh, checkbook money uh, or demand deposits that, uh, that the commercial banks can pile. And again, all demand deposit accounts that exist in, in the commercial banks can also not redeem into existing Fed notes. Um, currently, of course, this, this has dropped out, plays no role anymore. But if we would all go and wanted to dissolve our demand deposit accounts and wanted to have all what we allegedly own in our demand deposit accounts pay, paid out in cash, the entire banking system would, would be bankrupt. Uh, no bank has, has this amount. Um, currently, of course, this is not a big problem because there would be a bank holiday uh, instituted and then the Fed, which is the lender of last resort, more appropriate would be counterfeiter printer of last resort, they can then, of course, print any amount of notes in order to uh, fulfill all obligations. You realize why it was that they had to get rid of that gold stuff because uh, as much as they uh, uh, try to do miracles, uh, the amount of gold they could, of course, not after a bank holiday uh, come up with. But the amount of Fed notes and the amount of Danish kronas and so, and so forth, they can, uh, they can come up with after a few days. But again, if you go to all of your Danish banks, take all of your demand deposit accounts out, and every single bank in Denmark would be broke. Uh, all, had, all would have to close their, um, their doors. Now, how does this system then operate? Well, how is the money supply influenced? Um, there are um, two major factors. One is the uh, 
what we call the reserve requirements. That is regulated in different places differently, sometimes by law, sometimes by custom. Uh, that is simply uh, how, how many reserves uh, as compared with outstanding obligations a bank is supposed to um, have. Let's say 10%. Um, uh, um, that would mean that for, um, for every $100 of demand deposit accounts, they would have to have $10 in cash. Um, uh, $90, uh, $90 uh, they would not have. That is, that is a fraction that is not covered. Um, and uh, if we look at what happens to reserve requirements, reserve requirements have, uh, by and large, if you look over history, have been uh, continuously reduced. Um, when the American system was introduced, the reserve requirements were something like 20 20 percent. Um, then during World War I, um, uh, central banks are also very nice instruments in order to finance wars. You know, so if you finance wars, you either have to raise taxes, which takes a while, and people might give you trouble. Um, but if you have a central bank, war finance becomes very easy. You just simply lower your reserve requirements from 20% to 10%, and thereby you double the money supply from one day to the next. Um, this is, for instance, what the Americans did during World War I, which most other countries, most other countries did uh, similar, uh, similar things. And the second, um, uh, the second element that has an influence on the money supply, so reserve requirements going up, meaning always the money supply is increased, with the effects that I already explained, government always benefiting itself at the expense of the public. The second effect, uh, a se the second element that uh, has an influence on reserves, uh, on, uh, on the total money supply are what we call total reserves. Uh, reserves is money deposited in the banks. Um, and on the reserves, uh, two institutions have an influence. Uh, on the one hand, the public, and on the other hand, the Federal Reserve that is the central bank. Um, the public has an influence on the total reserves by either depositing money in the banks or withdrawing money in the banks. If they deposit money in the banks and get uh, a demand, de demand deposit or so, if they deposit money in the bank, then the reserves in the banking system go up and as reserves in the banking system go up, then the banking system can increase its demand deposit by a positive multiple of this increase in reserves. That is, if, I depo if we as a whole deposit on net uh, 10 additional dollars in the, bankings, in the banking system, uh, then the banking system can uh, create an additional 90, uh, 90 dollars uh, of demand deposits out of thin air and loan that out, okay, under a 10% reserve requirement. Uh, if we put $100 in net into the banking system, then the money, then the money supply, then an additional $900, $900 uh, can be created um, out of thin air on top of, on top of this. So, the public depositing money in the bank means the money supply will be increased by a mu positive multiple of this deposit. Um, under 100% reserve banking, of course, it would have no effect on the money supply. Under fractional reserve banking, it leads to an increase by a positive multiple of the money supply. 
The reverse happens if we withdraw money from the bank. Banks do not like to see that happen. Because if we withdraw money from the bank, then the reserves in the bank, banking system go down and they must now shrink their money supply by a positive multiple of this, uh, of this withdrawal. Um, to give you some, uh, some examples, for instance, that have an effect on these uh, changes in the public, what they do with uh, uh, reserves or not. For instance, as long as the drug market is uh, illegal, um, there is a greater demand for cash. Um, imagine, for instance, drugs would be completely legalized. What effect would that have on the money supply? Now, people would now deposit the money in the bank. They would pay their drug dealer with checks instead of with, uh, 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 with cash. So the money supply would increase by, uh, uh, by a positive multiple of the, net, um, of the net deposits. If they would just outlaw uh, the drinking of, uh, of, of beer and uh, smoking of cigarettes, uh, then of course the demand for cash would increase. The money supply would fall by a multiple of these net, net withdrawals. Um, What's the influence that the Fed has on, uh, on total reserves? I only want to mention the, uh, the most standard um, tool that the Fed uh, uses. Uh, that is uh, open market operations. Of which there exist two open market purchases and open market sales. What are open market operations? Open market operations are simply uh, the central bank goes into the open market and buys something or sells something. Uh, most of the time, for reasons that will become apparent, most of the time uh, they buy something. Uh, typically they buy um, existing government bonds but at least in the United States, they are not obliged to do that. They can, in principle, buy anything they want. They can buy, for instance, a Mercedes. Um, so how do they pay for the Mercedes? Uh, they pay for the Mercedes by creating a check out of thin air, uh, drawn on the, on the central bank. They simply write, drawn central bank, $100,000 and then they pay that to the Mercedes seller. Um, now what does the Mercedes seller then do? The Mercedes seller banks, of course, not with, yeah. the, with the central bank. Nobody banks with the central bank except the commercial banks. So he goes to his commercial bank and uh, presents them with his $100,000 check um, of, uh, uh, drawn on, on the uh, central bank and um, and the commercial bank then approaches the central bank and they have demand deposit accounts at the central bank just as we have demand deposit accounts here. So this bank then gets credited um, with uh, $100,000 uh, $100, uh, reserves have now in the banking system as a whole gone up by $100,000 uh, and uh, if the reserves have gone up by $100,000 at a reserve requirement of 10%, the banking system as a whole is now allowed to create 900,000 additional dollars worth in demand deposit accounts. How do they create them? Again, they create them out of thin air. Um, so you see, uh, the banking system uh, is a system that is rarely fully understood it is actually quite simple to understand, um, but once you understand it, um, most people uh, shake their heads and can't believe that such a thing is tolerated. Okay, that should end my, uh, my beloved banking lecture. <laughs>
if you have a 100% reserve requirement, then that would just mean that the interest rate margin you had to require for a loan would be much higher, so it would be much more expensive to loan money? Yeah, but it would be an interest rate that would be determined by genuine savings. Um, you see, like, yes, by printing, by printing up money, I can temporarily lower the interest rate, but not in the long run. Because there will be then eventually, because that involves an increase in the money supply, and that will appear as an inflation premium in, in the form of higher prices. Um, and the interest rate will then eventually adjust to the real interest rate again. Just the real interest rate would change by the amount of capital you have to hold. When you have a 100% reserve requirement and say that you have some cost of equity, meaning the cost of holding capital, that translates directly over to a margin on the real interest rate on your loan. Yeah, right. I mean, this is a, so this is you see, under, under, under fractional reserve banking, what takes place is, so to speak, a temporary falsification of the real interest rate. Um, if you have 100% reserve deposit banking plus uh, savings and loan banking, uh, the, real, the interest rate reflects, so to speak, always the real interest rate. Fractional reserve banking falsifies for yeah, uh, for a temporary period, what the real interest rate is. It gives the impression that there has been more, that there is more savings than there really is. Again, recall, I explained that under savings and loan banking, the loans that are extended are really backed up by goods that the savers themselves have sacrificed not to use. That is, if I, if I give you a dollar for a year, that means that I abstain from, let's say, buying, uh, buying a Coke right now. And, and you can buy the Coke. Okay? And you can drink the Coke while you are working on some investment project. Okay. Under fractional reserve banking, the situation is different. The bank prints up an additional dollar that they give you as a loan. But there is no person who has abstained from using, from drinking the Coke. That's why it's so much cheaper. Yeah, but that's why it also causes trouble. Um, because now I still want to drink the Coke because I have not abstained from drinking the Coke and you want the Coke at the same time also. You see the problem? It's like if you engage in an, investment, in an investment project, these investment projects can then not all be completed because there are just not enough saved up funds there in order to feed the workers during that time. But is that just a one-time increase in the price level and then you have adjusted and then it still works out the same way? Y yes, the price level so will then eventually go up. And if you, have, you have as had that increase in the price level. As so the price level more? goes up, then, then of course the interest rate will just uh, uh, will build into an inflation, in, will build an inflation premium into it also. And then the interest rate adjusts to its actual height. Yeah, but but in the meantime, trouble has occurred. Yeah, but since we have already had this reserve requirement for many years, I mean, the price level has adjusted many years ago. So now it's simply a question of now you can lo loan money for a lower interest rate. Yeah, but it goes on and on and on. It's like the, as, as we sit here, they, they extend further and further and further of these cheap loans. Well, it's not that the money, money growth rate is increasing I mean, it's pretty constant over the, over the years, so it could be held pretty constant. But if you require a 100% reserve requirement, you would still have to charge a much higher real interest rate on your loans. It's simply the cost of providing the funds for the loans is much higher. Look, uh, 
the interest rate is just a price like any other price. Um, it actually, it's a more important price because it uh, affects, so to speak, the economy as a whole. Um, the interest rate should also be determined by the supply um, of savings and the demand for savings. Um, only that is, so to speak, a correct price. Um, everything else is just uh, some sort of price, price control uh, that you introduce. Uh, you can, of course, you can artificially lower the price of milk. What, what do you get when you artificially lower the price of milk? Um, you get more people wanting this to buy milk like at the shop and then eventually... The price. Yes, it is this an is an like an increase in productivity. No, it isn't You are simply able to produce loans more productively. No, it so isn't. This is an no, you in don't produce more loans, you just produce more paper. That's the point. You don't produce no, more... The cost of real, real, loans. real loans are commodity loans. That is, you have an abstract for money for a moment. Just think of, think of a barter economy and think of what would loans consist of in a barter economy. In a barter economy, if I would give you a loan, I would give you real things. Okay, I give you my coat, I give you my drinks, I give you my meat, and so forth. And then you can just do something with these real things. Okay? In a barter economy, loans can be extended also. You admit that, right? They are then real goods. Okay? Um, in a monetary economy, by abstaining from using money, by handing it over for the bank to a, to a certain extent, what you do is exactly the same as in a barter economy. You also basically give goods to those who receive the loan, except they are unspecified goods. It's not my, it's not my suit. What he does with the money, he buys it, might buy the suit, or he might buy her shirt, or he might buy that coffee machine. I do not know what he will buy. Uh, but nonetheless, there are real things that I give them. On the other hand, if I print up an additional ticket, and nobody has saved one more bit than before, then, of course, I extend more credit than there really is. There is not more savings. I only create the illusion that there is more savings. And because I create the illusion that there is more savings, more investment projects will be begun, but not all investment projects can be completed because of a lack of genuine savings. But I think this will be, this will be the subject of, of the lecture on on business cycles, I'm only touching, touching upon that, that is, so to speak, the main, the main drift of, um, of the lecture on business cycles. I mean, I can give that lecture too, but I have decided that Guido should do that. So I, I'll ask you to wait until uh, Guido Hülsmann will give his lecture on business cycles um, to make that perfectly clear what fundamental difference there is between um, uh, artificially manipulated interest rates through extension of fiduciary or circulation credit as compared to uh, a regular expansion which takes place uh, due to increased genuine savings on the part of the public. I also have some questions. Uh, do you consider it fraud when an airline company with say 100 seats from a destination A to B sells 110 tickets uh, because they expect that not all customers will show up. Is it fraud if they tell the customers we sell more tickets than we have? No. And if you uh, if there is uh, if more people show up then and you cannot yeah. come on no, I understand. plane, you'll get a, a I some kind of question. refund. I can, I, let me, um, on the one hand, let me just make you aware of um, one of my articles. Uh, it's called Against Fiduciary Media in the f first, f first issue of the first volume of the quarterly journal of Austin Economics where I deal with 
uh, with this in, 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 in gr great detail, it, which is available on, on the internet uh, through Mises.org. Um, but to be brief, no, the airline does not promise you now um, that you will get a seat. Um, the bank, the fractional reserve, you can come at any time and get it. That is what it makes it, makes it fraudulent. The airline does not commit a fraud when they say, we will transport you in a week and they oversell right now. They are not committing a fraud right now. Um, so this is something entirely different from the promise, everybody can come right now. If the airline would say, we are standing here right now, um, you are ready to board, and then they oversell, then it would be fraud. Look, the airline could, in 10 days, they might have a second airplane there. Um, and they are willing, of course, to buy you off. So it is, di it is different what sort of promise they make. They do not make the promise, you can come at any time you want. They say, you can come in one week. Uh, and in one week, they might well be able to satisfy all demands. OK, thank you again. Um, give me five more minutes, and then, then my last lecture for today.